Well, it was somewhere uh, 1981 or 82, I don't remember years, but it was about the third NAMAP meeting. So whenever that first meeting was, this was about the third NAMAP meeting. Uh, Shifra uh, asked me to come to one of the meetings. And then I got a follow-up phone call from uh, Norma Barkin uh, to come uh, to the meeting. And uh, so I came. And uh, the meeting was on a topic that I wasn't very happy with. But then I did come back uh, to the following meeting. First of all, Norma was very persuasive. She kept calling. Uh, so that was one of the, the reasons. But the other reason is because and, uh, I remember something that happened to me in Israel. Uh, one day I was walking uh, in a poshy kind of neighborhood in Herzliya, and uh, I see this big house. And I see very simply dressed, even poorly dressed women sitting uh, around these tables. And there are shimshias, um, these umbrellas. Uh, and the women, these women were being served by very well dressed, very um, upscale dressed women and I didn't speak Hebrew yet then this was among the first few weeks that I was in Israel maybe I was there three weeks or four weeks when I saw this but I asked El Dad because there was a sign on on the door and, and it, it was a Naamat sign and this was a resort for women with lots of children who never had a vacation in their lives. And they were invited to this resort for three days or a week, I don't remember which, where they were served and they, and this was not far from the beach and they could walk to the beach, etc. And, uh, and I said to myself then, my goodness, what a fantastic country I came to. Not only do they bring the women here, but they provide childcare for the many children while the women have this vacation. At the time, Naamat meant nothing to me. Uh, but then, I remembered, after that first meeting, I remembered this. So with me, it was more the, the memory of what Naamat did in Israel that really drew me to continue with the group. I just came from Israel in 1980, after 10 years in Israel, and I, um, I didn't have a lot of friends, and uh, so somebody said, well, you've got to join groups and everything. So the first group I joined was ORT, um, but that really d didn't speak to me. I mean, the people were nice, but that's where I met Shifra, and then when this new group opened, I liked the women. Uh, that were there, and uh, those women, of course, included the very first women. It included Simon and Shifra and uh, Rivka and Trish and uh, Louisa Granti. So th those were the core women that were in the group at the time. It was the initial stay was because of what now, because of that experience in Israel. The rest of the stay was because these these women became my friends, and uh, and they became my French group. And as a matter of fact, I don't think I had even one friend that eventually was not a, a Naamat member. And then I got involved at a national level, uh, at which I'm still involved. And uh, I've been on the board uh, ever since. And now I'm ex officio because I I, I did my. But, but I'm still on the board and I still help out now and that. I came to Toronto um, in 2002. Uh, and so that's about 20, so I was 20 years with the Hamilton group, uh, Nitsan. But uh, when I came to Toronto, uh, they wanted me to join a Toronto group. And I said, there's no way I'm joining any other group. I am a Nitsan, I'm Hamilton. 
Namat Hamilton, and when I'm introduced at the board, I'm still introduced as part of Namat Hamilton, even though I live in Toronto. I have several really great Namat memories, and it's hard to say what the favorite is. Shifra and I used to drop the kids off at school, and we used to go for walks. And we used to pick up empty bottles and empty beer cans. And Shifra would take them to the beer store or the liquor store, and we'd get money for it. Uh, the, the beer store, not the liquor store. And we'd get money for it. Five cents for a can, ten cents for a bottle. You have no idea how much money we actually um, picked up. So one of my memories is that we're walking and Shifra sees at the bottom of a garbage bin two bottles. That's 20 cents. <laughs> we can't reach it. <laughs> Karen, Shifra's little daughter is there. She says, Karen, can you get it? <laughs> she held her up and Karen picked up the bottles and went to get it. So that's one of the nice memories. But it was, it was, it, it was actually uh, Shifra's um, doggedness in, in, in doing anything she could for Namat, even, even doing those beer cans and, and those 10 cents, really, that we went to construction sites, lots and lots of beer cans, and they added up and they all went into the Namat coffer. And in those days, we weren't, it was, uh, you know, it was hard for us to meet our quota and everything. So every little penny uh, did, did count. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, the other, my favorite memory is, is the memory of, um, uh, of Mordechai Richler. Uh, I was asked to drive Mordechai Richler from his hotel in Toronto, where he was uh, staying, to Hamilton. And I, I went and he, he said he'd be waiting for me at the lobby and I got out and of course I recognized him and I went to him and I said, good morning Mr. Richler, my name is Agnes Meinhardt and I'm going to be taking you to Hamilton and I put my hand out to him and he refused to shake my hand. Okay, we get into the car and we're driving. And I know that we share a passion, the Montreal Canadiens. And I try to make conversation. Of course, the Canadians were doing very badly that season. So I tried to make conversation with him, and he just didn't respond. He was very, very into his own world. And, and so I got the hint, and I, I didn't talk to him. But then, because everybody thinks I'm always late for everything, they made me pick him up too early. And we get to Hamilton about 40 minutes earlier than we should. And I ask him, uh, Mr. Richler, would you like to, we're very, very early, would you like to stop for a drink or something? And he said, yes, but a real drink. And I didn't know where we could get a real drink. In, uh, at, at, at 11 in the morning. But I went on to Hess Street and there was this pub kind of thing and I said, well, let's try over here. And we, we go in and he orders himself uh, a whiskey uh, and he asks me what I would like and I ordered myself a Crown Royal and we both drank up. He was so impressed, I think. But once he had that first whiskey in him, he totally changed. And I don't know whether it was the whiskey or whether it was seeing that I'm drinking with him. We had another together. I had to stop there because I still had to drive him to the Fontan. But, uh, but he had another. And then we started talking about Les Canadiens and, and uh, the games we saw in the past and everything. A totally different person, very, very, very warm and friendly. And the gig, sir, was in the end, he said, 
where are we going? I said, this is the Fontbonne Auditorium for the St. Joseph's Hospital. He said, hospital? And he says, do you think I can see a doctor? I have this terrible rash on my right hand. And we got somebody, and he saw a dermatologist right there, because he was afraid that this was something that, that uh, could be contagious. And then the penny fell. He didn't shake my hand because he thought it was contagious. Because the thing, then he showed me his hand and he said, maybe it's contagious and I don't want anything to happen to my wife. And he, he hadn't touched me. He hadn't shaken my hand. So, in the end, Mr. Richler, Mordechai Richler, was a total mensch. He didn't want to contaminate me with his hand, and that's why he didn't shake it. So that's really my favorite story, because, uh, because Namat gave me an opportunity <laughs> to get to know somebody whose writings I loved. I read his books while I was in Israel, and they just brought back memories, of, and I grew up in Montreal. Not exactly in his time period, but really, my earliest memories were very, very, the Montreal was very similar at that time to the Montreal he was describing, the immediate post-war or the pre-war Montreal. I mean, in the 50s, Montreal was much different from that. So, and I was in Israel and just brought back memories. This event, that first author luncheon that really, and the subsequent early ones, that really brought the group together as a cohesive whole. Uh, the success was phenomenal. We, we didn't expect uh, what, uh, what we were able to accomplish. We didn't know we could accomplish it. We didn't expect to accomplish it. Uh, and, and we made money at the same time. Uh, and the whole process was just a lot of fun. Jean Beliveau, um, I'm a, a, an avid Montreal Canadian fan, and I was, uh, as a little girl, I was in love with different players. I was, at, like, absolutely in love with them. Jean Beliveau was really my, my all-time favorite hockey player. And so when he came uh, to the meeting, uh, I, had to, I had to tell him that, you know, I was a little girl. <laughs> and you were my hero, and I wanted to marry you. <laughs> and his answer was, <laughs> you're not the first woman that has told me that. And I said, I believe, I, I believe you, because you were just, he was, he was just so elegant on the ice. And after he retired, he was just such a mensch that he never disappointed at any level, and he didn't disappoint that night. He actually pulled me over and, and he, uh, he asked for a picture, and it was, uh, uh, it was just wonderful. And I have that picture, and I, I love it. And, uh, yeah, so that was, that was a high point, another high point as well. And I never would have met him had it not been for Nama. I account for it by, by our originality. There are a few reasons, but really the, 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 all groups share the same thing. Camaraderie, people getting together and for a good cause. So uh, all groups in Hamilton have that same cause. Why we continue, I attribute to our creativity. And uh, I, I remember that um, when we first, uh, you know, in the first couple of years, they kept asking us to join the Toronto Bazaar to have our own booth, and that would be our own fundraiser. And we went to one of the bazaars, and we decided this is not for us. Nothing spoke to any of us about bazaar. And so we needed to find another fundraiser. And, uh, and Shifra came up with the idea of an author luncheon. Uh, and she got that idea from the Burlington Library. The Burlington Librarian said that they, uh, they have quarterly, they invite authors quarterly, 
and people pay ten dollars and it, it makes some money and they got a crowd of about 30 I mean they weren't but we decided to make a luncheon out of it and, and a very big deal and uh, so we had to get an author uh, and Shifra had just finished reading Mendelssohn's, Dr. Mendelssohn's book called Raising Your Kids Despite the Medical Profession or something like that. I'm not sure what the name is, but, uh, and she loved it because we you know that. And, and she read on the, on the flap that his daughter lives in Toronto. And so she had the chutzpah to call him because he lived in the States and said to him, one of these days when you're visiting your daughter, could you come and talk to our group, our Namat group? It's a cosperism, blah, 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 all the rest. But, and unbelievably, he said yes. And that was our first author luncheon. And uh, it was at the YWCA. And so it, it was the creativity of the author luncheon I've already told you about. Uh, so that, that, that first and second and third, those early author luncheons proved to us that, you know, we're really different from all the other groups. And we weren't just reaching out to Jews. We were reaching out to the whole of Hamilton community. We got press time for getting Mendelssohn in and Knowlton Nash, and David Suzuki. And, well, we know now how many, Mordechai Richler, but how many other big names uh, have, have come through. And uh, some of them uh, were a little harder to sell tickets for, but, but we always came together. And, and I think that gave us this high that, that just kept kept the group going. And we know that we're different, and we're different for many reasons. Uh, one of, well, the camaraderie is, is there, well, the same problems other groups have. But we also did something very interesting a little bit later on, about 10 years into the group, when a mass uh, of new people, new members, came in. And there was some feeling of in-group, out-group, the new members didn't feel that they actually belonged. The older members didn't really realize this and, and I think one of the things that was really spectacular about this group, again, and it could have fallen apart, those new members could have left, right? And then we would have been with our old core. But instead, we did a retreat where we, where we actually voiced all these concerns. And I know, as part of the old guard, the, that we had no idea that people were feeling this way. And so we had to question what it was that gave this message, because really, in our souls, we were welcoming these people with open arms and yet they didn't see this so what was it that 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 was radiating this kind of thing and we talked it out and i think after we talked it out that feeling dissipated among the newer members uh, because they realized that it wasn't a clique it was you know, we knew each other for longer we didn't know what it was that we were projecting, but after that, uh, I think the group again resolidified with newer members uh, coming in. So, and I think that's important for any kind of group development uh, to make sure that everybody can air there. Uh, and, and and when there's conflict, and there always is, always some people have hurt feelings in others. I think in our group there were enough people to be able to mend those conflicts 
that kept it from festering and because what could happen is that one one person leaves that's not a big thing but one person leaves and can take a whole bunch of other people with them that could have been detrimental to the group so there are a few uh, a few things but i really really attribute the the growth to the fact that there's some kind of recognition in hamilton that this is a special group there is, and I think it's special because of the way we were able to do, because of the programming that we do for the community, not just for ourselves. I, I would say join, I would say um, uh, be patient, and then because eventually you will feel very much part of this group. In the, in the beginning, uh, this group was made up mostly of women who were new to the city, new to Hamilton, uh, many of them ex-Montrealers, but people from other places as well. Uh, people who had good Zionist backgrounds. Uh, most of us had labor Zionist backgrounds, but good Zionist backgrounds went to Jewish camps, etc. So there was that, that, many of us were in Israel for shorter or longer periods of time, so there was that, so there was the Zionist, there was the thing. Um, at the time, most of us had kids in the Hebrew Academy, so there was that. There were many, many things, although the Hebrew Academy wasn't the biggest thing because the Hebrew Academy actually spawned three groups. I mean, not spawned, there was Hadassah, there was the National Council of Jewish Women, and then there was this new Naamat group. And uh, all, mo most of those women in those groups had kids in the Hebrew Academy as well. So, but but uh, it was the fact that many of us were new to the area, and, uh, um, and then slowly we had some um, Hamilton, Hamiltonians uh, also joined, but uh, so there, there, there was a commonality that that brought us together uh, in the first place. And I would say to these new women that the reason they might want that they would will find some kind of commonality in this group as well, whether it's kids in the Hebrew Academy, whether it's. Um, um, Professional, uh, you know, professional relationships like uh, we have doctors, we have physiotherapists, we have librarians and teachers and, and whatever, and, and the love of Israel is, is always uh, a part of it. We did have some, uh, some conflict uh, over Israel, um, but, uh, and I have to mention another program which, which I think ranks very high in my estimation, and that's the program that we had with Palestinian and Israeli artists. Uh, I think that that was absolutely marvelous. Uh, it connected us with people that we would never have been connected with, and it really showed, first of all, the art itself spoke to the conflict, but it, it, it spoke to a hope that things could be resolved. And that was a time when there was a lot of hope. It was uh, the Oslo Accord time and everything, and it's just a shame that things didn't work out, but the goodwill was there in both the Arab community in Hamilton and, of course, our group's community and and some some of the other Jewish uh, uh, groups but over the years there there has been some uh, some conflict over Israel some uh, some of us are, are a little bit more critical of some of the policies and others of us are less critical of some of the policies but that never but but that never split us I think because there were enough on both sides, perhaps, but I think really because all of us are there for the love of Israel, and whether whether it's you know how we interpret what's best for Israel may differ, but the end goal is always the same: what's best for Israel. 
focus on women's rights uh, from the very, very foundation of the organization uh, was what appealed to me uh, then uh, the most. And I, I say then, and it would probably still appeal to me now, because then the fight for women's equality was at its height here in North America. And, and, and learning about uh, this, this movement that I'm part of, that in Israel they, they were doing things in the 1920s and 30s for women. This was an organization by women, for women, and for working women, so that they'll have equal rights. And we, we know the stories of the kibbutzim and all that. But one of, one of the stories that impressed me the most was Moetza Tapo uh, women wanted to help build the country and, and the construction industry wouldn't let them. And so Moetza Tapoalot got together these women who wanted to build, to be construction workers. And, uh, and there are four buildings in Tel Aviv that were built and entirely by women through Moetza Tapola. So this, this, this really, really impressed me. And of course, later on, when, when uh, Naamat was, uh, uh, was pushing for e equal rights for women in the Knesset, and the Knesset uh, passed all those equal rights laws, etc. So this is not only, this, it, it, so Naamat differs from Hadassah and, uh, and uh, uh, other Jewish women's organizations in that it doesn't just send money to Israel for the good causes for like Vitzo. Um, Vitzo also has daycare centers but at the same time Naamat was doing all this work for women's equality uh, and of course their work on violence, uh, the more recent work on violence against women and violence in the families with their four centers for um, uh, for um, treating for for dealing with violence in families, and of course the uh, the newest addition to that is the Glickman Center for um, Battered Women. Uh, all of these things are very very impressive uh, to me. Uh, more impressive than just the work that we're doing uh, for the. Um, in the daycares and in the high schools, uh, but this focus on women's rights and this focus on fighting violence. Now, Matt had a, has a program or set up a program, I don't know if they're running it or if somebody else, but Naamat actually set up the program of going to uh, the young female recruits to uh, the uh, IDF uh, and talking to them about how they can recognize uh, which what what harassment is, which which soldiers to to be aware be beware of, uh, how to recognize abusive behavior in the early stages of dating, and things like that. I mean, these are all programs that are above and beyond what most other organizations do. And if, if people, if the women of our group know this, that's another reason for wanting to, to be to, together and, and to maintain it. So it's not, it, it's just a little bit, to me, it talks to my ideals as, uh, as a woman. And uh, the Glickman Center uh, sends uh, emissaries out and, and brings people in. It's one of the most successful uh, shelters in the world because they also do uh, training and counseling for, for the husbands, etc. And they've won prizes in Europe for the work that they're doing. Another thing to be very proud of.